welcome. In this video, I'm going to talk about the assumptions we make when we use linear regression models and about how we can use residual plots to actually check these assumptions. So, we've introduced linear regression as this Swiss Army knife, as this very widely applicable and powerful tool for statistical analysis. However, there are some assumptions that actually need to be met, some of them for the results to make any sense at all, and some others for the statistical significance tests to be reliable. Quite often when the assumptions are not met, there are things we can do to work around that, often transform the data, for example. Sometimes we might need to opt for a different modeling approach. So what are the assumptions behind linear models? Firstly, there are two that we need to think about just when thinking about the data. Firstly, we need a continuous outcome variable. If we have a categorical outcome variable, linear regression is not going to, to work. We also need to have independent observations. If we have something like repeated measures, or a time series, or participants who are somehow grouped, we should at least think about doing something like a multi-level model. So, before we, before we even start, those are questions to be answered. Then, once we actually have the data, one key thing to consider is whether we actually have linear relationships. If the relationships have any other shape, our model parameters aren't going to make much sense. We also assume homoscedasticity, which just means that there's equal variance at all points along the regression line. We also assume a normal distribution of the residuals, and finally, that there are no important outliers. Those four conditions, they can all be tested by looking at residual plots. So, go through an example of a model that is clearly problematic. So, let's say we're interested in the link between per capita income and life expectancy, we just naively run a linear regression model. We clearly shouldn't do it, because if we look at the scatter plot, we see that fitting a straight line here is not a good idea. But if we fit a model, how can we assess whether it meets the assumptions? For that, we need to use the LM function, save the result into a variable, then use the plot function to get four diagnostic plots, and then check them for issues. So the first of the plots helps us to see whether there is a linear relationship, because a linear relationship implies that there is no link between the fitted values, the model estimates, and the residuals, how far off they are. Clearly, in this particular case, that's not the case. The red line shows that there is a very strong link between the predictions and the residuals. So, this condition is not met, and we shouldn't be using the model. So let's try again. Let's use the logarithmic transformation so that now each step along the x-axis implies a doubling of national income. In the scatter plot, we see that this looks more like a straight line. So, we got to a linear relationship. If we look at the new diagnostic plots, this time we are fine. There's no relationship between the fitted values and the residuals. So, this assumption of a linear model is met. The next assumption is the, no the normal distribution of residuals. For that, the second diagnostic plot is a so-called QQ plot. And what this does is that it plots our residuals, the actual distribution of our residuals, against the theoretically expected distribution of residuals if they're normally distributed. So what we want to see is a straight line. A straight line indicates that the actual distribution and the theoretical distributions exactly match. 
Clearly we don't have a straight line here. In fact, we have too many large negative residuals. So we are overestimating life expectancy more often than we should if the residuals were normally distributed. So potential problem here. Next, we look at whether we have equal variance along the regression line, so whether homoscedasticity is given. For that, we get a third plot here of standardized residuals um, compared to the fitted values. And we see that probably this, the, the variances are not equal. It looks quite clearly like the variance at smaller predicted life expectancies is greater than at higher predicted life expectancies. So we get this typical kind of funnel-shaped form. So this assumption is also violated. Finally, we get a fourth plot that allows us to think about whether we have outliers and whether those outliers are actually influential. Because what's more important than just knowing whether we have unusual values is whether those values influence the slope or slopes in our regression model. And for that, this plot shows us how much leverage the points have. And there are basically no points with high leverage that are changing the direction of the line. High leverage is just defined as extreme predictor values. So countries with very low or very high incomes have the potential to shift the line. While countries with middling incomes, even if they have outlier life expectancies, don't matter all that much, unless they're very far away. And that's where Cook's distance comes in. Cook's distance combines the question of leverage and outlier values and basically gives us a rating for how problematic a point might be. If the model is meeting this assumption, we won't see the lines for Cook's distance, like in this case. So let's look at an example where the model definitely does not meet the assumption. Let's use the same gap in the data set, but this time with two data entry errors. So we have one country, the GDP that's far too high. That's a point of very high leverage. It's actually not a big problem because it doesn't shift the line very much. It has a fairly typical life expectancy. However, if you have one point that has a leverage that's at least twice as much as any other point, definitely deserves a second look. We have another country that is a strong outlier on the life expectancy, and this now shows up as a point with high Cox distance. So now the red uh, dotted lines are coming into the picture, and they alert us that we should have a look at this data point. In this case, that would be very helpful because it would allow us to spot data entry errors. And actually, they're quite common, whether you use your own data or someone else's data. So it's really worth looking at this plot and seeing if there are any points that, that are flagged as requiring some extra attention. So how does the model do across the four assumptions? So we do have a linear relationship. We don't have a normal distribution of residuals. We don't have equal variance. And we don't really have outliers that matter. So what do we do with this? Actually, the two most fundamental assumptions are met. So that's good news. If we have outliers that determine everything, or if we have no linear relationship, the model is not going to make any sense. But if we now see that we have a higher variance, so greater errors, in countries with low levels of life expectancy, it might indicate that some variable is missing. We can now think about possible variables. Maybe countries with comparatively lower life expectancy have greater variance, in terms of public health provision, in terms of education. So maybe those are variables that we need to bring in. While at higher levels of life expectancy and higher levels of GDP, the variance in those missing variables might be smaller. So 
In this situation, we would need to think about what variables are missing, how can we find them, can we add them to the model. And right now, not going to do that, um, or you might, you might think about doing that in class, and about how we are able to do that. But in general, you will never find a model that perfectly meets all the assumptions. So how serious are deviations? Well, deviations from linear relationships, if they are severe, then they're very serious. Because basically they mean that we're estimating a line of best fit that cannot capture the distribution of the data. So this is something to take very seriously, really look out for. If you have these deviations, quite often we can do data transformations to find a different version of the variable that is actually linearly related to the outcome. So in this particular case, it's the, the logarithmic transformation. Normal distribution of the residuals, on the other hand, is often not a big issue because it affects the reliability of significance testing unless our sample is large enough, and large enough often means 30 or more cases. So often we have samples that are large enough where we can um, disregard this. If we have a small sample and we need to worry about it, then again, data transformations might help. If the assumption of equality of variance of homoscedasticity is violated, it very often indicates that we actually have variables missing. Sometimes it might be natural. An example that people commonly use is spending on non-essential goods. Rich households have a greater variance in how much they spend on non-essential goods than poor households. So that would be national heteroscedasticity and not something that we could try to just get out of the data. Usually it indicates that we are missing some variables. So ideally we should find missing variables. If we then have large heteroscedasticity left, it might make our p-values unreliable. And then there are robust ways of estimating standard errors that can counter this. So in practice, when you observe this, think about variables that might be missing, check how big of a problem it is, and if it is a big problem, then again start thinking about data transformations. But this is one of the most contested assumptions, so it's one of the moments where it might make sense to take your data and share it with an experienced statistician and get feedback on what to do with it. Finally, outliers. Well, if you have outliers with a lot of leverage, they can on their own determine regression parameters, slopes and intercepts entirely. And clearly that's not what we want. So if you have influential outliers, you need to do something about them. Sometimes we might say, well, these are actually cases that are not within the scope of what we're trying to predict, so we're going to exclude them. Sometimes you might take steps to reduce their influence, like uh, doing a nearest neighbor transformation, so you pull the outliers back towards the distribution, um, or you might do some other kind of data transformation. But it's really important here that this needs to be reported explicitly. Otherwise, it just becomes a way of falsifying your data to fit the model. So what to remember from this? Well, one thing to really remember is what the assumptions actually are, so that you can be mindful of them. First assumption is an independence of observations. And sometimes you might have a potential for dependence of observations in your data collection, but you might see that actually scores of students within one class aren't really related to each other. If that is the case, then 
you might have independence of observations in your data, even though the data was collected in a way that suggests that there might have been dependence. But something to think about. We're assuming linear relationships, they need to be given at least in the range that we are interested in, in our model. We see normally distributed residuals, which really matters if your sample size is small. And then we need equal variance along the entire regression line. And finally, we don't want influential outliers. And incidentally, ANOVAs and t-tests share exactly these assumptions, except for linear relationships, which don't make sense for categorical predictors. And homoscedasticity in that case means equal variance in each group. If you want to figure out whether these assumptions are met, we need to look at um, diagnostics such as the residual plots. There are also formal tests, but the problem with formal tests is that it's very hard to interpret how serious the deviation is. While if you look at the diagnostic plots and gain some experience, it's a lot easier to say this looks good enough and actually this looks highly problematic. So I would recommend using the plots more than the formal tests. If we have serious deviations, then we either need to change the model, add some variables, possibly add interactions, or transform variables. And we'll go through some examples of that together. One common fix that I just want to point out is to work with ranks rather than the values of the variables. So traditionally in statistics, we have this distinction into parametric tests where data is normally distributed and non-parametric tests where it's not. For example, we have a t-test and a man whitney test, ANOVA and Graskell wallace Basically, what these tests do is they take the data, transform it to ranks, and then run the parametric test. Ranks, in this case, literally just means we take all the observations, order them by size, and then number them. Largest, second largest, third largest. The assumptions that we just discussed still apply to, to this kind of data, but they're usually much easier to satisfy. However, we lose a lot of information because we're moving from very fine-grained data towards data that no longer takes the distance between points into account, but just puts them all together. Still, this can be one way of getting towards a solution when you have data that doesn't meet the assumptions. That much for now. Please take a moment to think about what was unclear in this so that you can bring your questions to class. See you there.